Welcome, everybody. It's Dr. Doug Pernikoff of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, and I have my very special and beautiful co-host, Cindy Vickers. Say hi, Thank Cindy. You. Uh, hi, Cindy. <laughs> and, and today we have a very, very, very renowned and special guest, Dr. Sue Savage Rumbo, is a friend of mine. She is uh, I have so many titles I don't even know where to begin. She is the president of the Bonobo Hope, and we'll talk about what bonobos are in just a moment. She's been a scientist for over forty-two years and uh, has uh, written over four books, are co-authored, and God knows how many articles. And more notably, she was ranked as one of the top 10 most influential researchers of the decade by Time Magazine, and also has, um, to her credits, one of the 100th most significant scientific papers in the past century and had to do with language comprehension in bonobos. So the, you want to say hi? Hello, hello, hello. What a voice, beautiful. And of course, the first question I think we have is, what is a bonobo? You know, can you define in your, ter- in your mind what you consider a bonobo to be? A bonobo is an ape. Of course, all humans are apes, but the most common ape that people know of, I guess, is King Kong. Yeah. Bonobos are a little small compared to King Kong. And they're even smaller than chimpanzees and smaller than orangutans and smaller than gorillas. But they look like a combination of a gorilla and a chimpanzee, but little. Littler. And where, what else about them? I know they're uniquely uh, found, and geographically, they're only in one space, essentially. They're right. only found in the heart of the darkest Congo. That's right. And it takes several uh, days by boat or walking to get to most of their habitat. Very cool. And uh, they are endangered because there's still a lot of hunting in the Congo, as mm-hmm. are gorillas and chimpanzees. All apes except humans are endangered, actually. We're, we're very endangered. We just don't realize <laughs> but it. But we do it to our, ourselves rather yes. than have a different predator. Right, uh, there are 8 billion of us or more, so we're yeah. not technically endangered. Right. We may feel endangered, but there's a lot of us here. Just yeah. take well, a drive on the street. Yeah, we don't care true. about accuracy or technicalities <laughs> here. <laughs> just, really well, bad. unfortunately, there's only about 20,000 estimated bonobos in the wild. Is that correct? Something like that. Maybe less. Yes, but it's very, very difficult to make estimates. And as you know, that a, a new species of orangutan was just found. Tell so you can miss that. a whole species. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were oh, there's over 800 of this new species of orangutan. There are two species historically represented or considered, and now we have a third pure new species. It's amazing that these things are still dis- you know still still discovered <laughs> this late in the game for us. So every time we take away a swath of forest, God knows what we lose. We just don't know. So I think I told Cindy one time when I traveled in my past, I'd go through, uh, in particular, I was in Sumatra, and we were flying and driving from space to space, uh, city to city, through the woods and stuff. And you would sometimes see literally days of people just burning forest. And they were going to cut these forests down, and then they would plant something like coconut or oil palm. So be this diverse to this very monotypic or one species kind of representation. Of course, what do we destroy in the meanwhile? We don't know. And then the other problem is that when you do that kind of decimation, people kind of, they encompass that area. They become the charcoal uh, collectors. So they go in and burn the wood and develop charcoal. And they build these communities along the way and around. And then suddenly you've not only introduced the destruction, but now you've introduced people that are going to cause more problems. And that's kind of the way it went. It was very depressing just to drive around and see that all. Sort of like the United States. Is that what you're saying? We don't even know what we've destroyed here because we weren't <laughs> here. And, you know, <laughs> if we were here in the 1800s or the 1700s, we'd probably well, be pretty depressed about what we see today. Just more so. people, more people, more people, more houses, more apartments, more yeah. condos, more buildings. Less yeah. land, yeah. less animals, stuff mm-hmm. like that, yeah. So I get excited if I see skunks and foxes and coyotes in my backyard because I feel like I'm in a special opportunity and I'm surrounded by parks, so I get some kind of preservation of all that. But back to our topic. Yeah, please, (laughs) by all means. So so we know these bonobos are very, very interesting, and they are considered, I think, the most intelligent man, (laughs) the most intelligent animal next to man, or maybe they're just as intelligent as man, and speak to that. 
Well, anatomically, um, they're, they're more similar to us than any of the other living great apes. In what way? <clears throat> Some of the features. Their um, skull is smaller, doesn't have the prognathism that most other apes have. That's your uh, word for the day, by the way. Prognathism? <laughs> yeah, is that prognathism. Ex- extension of the jaw. Our face has kind of flat, mm-hmm. and uh, faces of apes tend to extend out. The jaw tends to extend out as they get older, although all their babies have flat faces. Mm-hmm. Bonobos look like an infantile version of a gorilla. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. Except they have kind of a tufted... Not yes. always, but kind yes. of a tufted hair. And they have longer legs, and it's easier for them to stand upright, quite easy for them to walk upright. So when you say they're smaller than um, a chimp, even? <laughs> if, if a, Generally. If a bonobo were standing on their legs and standing as upright as they can, about how tall are they? About four feet. About four feet, okay. So they kind of give you the image of, you know, in an evolutionary stand, what a transition species might look like or like australopithecus or yeah. lucy in the sky with diamonds yeah there you go and now you tell me that historically some of the uh, you've been to africa to see them and you told me that um, historically some of the native tribes talk about a historical relationship with bonobos and early tribal people Yes, the areas where they've been studied the longest are studied. They're studied there because when Dr. Kano from Japan rode his bicycle around the entire central basin of the Congo, asking where bonobos were, he found that in some places people did not hunt or eat the bonobos, and in those places there were legends that humans and bonobos for many centuries lived together in the forest. Wow. Uh, just as two human tribes might live mm-hmm. together. That doesn't mean they interbred, but they were like brothers. They mm-hmm. considered, you know, this is my brother in a, in a sense. They honored and, one another that way. Uh, they did. And the humans spent much more time in the trees at that point. And the humans and the bonobos are said to share some words, like the word for water and fire and dye and electric eel. Really? Those words are said to be the same in Longondo and uh the bonobo language. Uh-huh. So that's interesting. You've already introduced the concept that there's a language there, you know, and the average human just thinks of animals making noises. And, you know, this noise is specific to an elephant. This is, a spe- but, you know, I know there's so much more there because I've been around you for a long time. <laughs> so. Well, and just a cognitive ability that, that people question, that, that they would even be capable of kind of making those distinctions and, um, and then relating it to some way of communication, communicating it specifically. Mm-hmm. So, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> now, bonobos were actually recognized as a, a unique species or a unique individual. What in the was it the fifties or the forties? I think in nineteen twenties or thirties there were study of the Belgian collections of, of, of skulls uh-huh. and uh, uh, a scientist at that time thought that they were a distinct species but they weren't actually brought into the United States and thoroughly surveyed and recognized until uh, really in the 70s. Oh wow. So, so if, um, if in fact there were bonobos that were living um, just as a neighboring tribe and, and, and the human tribe sort of considered them brothers, that seems to have a really, like they have a great family relations and are living similarly. How difficult then was it for them to be brought into the United States or any other place and then put in a cage in a zoo? I mean, did they, I know most animals do not do well, but you know, is it significantly worse for them? I think it's very bad for them because they are so human-like. It's very much like taking a human child of one or two years and getting getting several of them and putting them in a cage and putting food on the floor and hosing the cage down every day and trying to raise them together. And, of course, if you take them when they're really young, which is what's generally done with all apes, they're not going to be able to grow up with language because they won't have a culture around them. Yeah. Right, so that it's it's very much the way any being learns. I mean, if they're deprived of the social uh, cultural experience, then right, and anything that is linguistic and anything that is talking about just st- a family structure and um, yeah. working. 
They don't well, have any of that. And that's why we, unfortunately, in zoos, we grew up and we see these exaggerated behaviors, you know, from animals like chimps and stuff and gorillas throwing poop and stuff like that. I think that that's the only way they know how to express themselves. It's crazy making. Yeah. And I, uh, we've had a guest, Connie's been on our show, Connie Casey, who has the chimpanzees. And actually, it was interesting. I took Sue well, two years ago, maybe, to visit Connie's group. And these are chimps that I've known since I was, they were babies or just born. And most of them, especially the big males, love to show off and do horrible things socially, like throw pee or water or whatever, spit on you, whatever. And I was so amazed. I was really, I mean, I knew a lot about what she was doing and historically, but I saw her walk in and Sue was able to communicate with these chimps. And they immediately came down to her and either because of their facial expressions or the the uh, speech that you gave them, um, they were interested in communicating and interacting. It was a totally different game. They became like interested students. It was really great. Well, they certainly liked you, Doug. And I think some of the things that they were doing that maybe you thought were, you know, kind of inappropriate from a human social standpoint, they were just really trying to show you that they were big and strong too, and they could do things, and they just wanted, you know, your validation. That well, I they should, were able to I do wish that. I would have known that. Would have validated them a long time ago. <laughs> would have had a lot less poop to clean off my shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about. Where your interests, you told me the other day something about your childhood, but when did you get sort of a mature uh, recognition of where your interests were driving you towards science? And then, of course, get into how you connected with bonobos. Was it chimps first and then bonobos and whatever? Well, yes. I, I was interested in child development and learning behavior, I think in part because my dad always said, I have seven kids and you're all so different. You know, why is that? And so... I became interested in psychology mm-hmm. and uh, wanted to study learning and behavior and was hoping to study with B.F. Skinner and probably would have worked with pigeons mm-hmm. uh, and possibly rats if I'd gone to Harvard and studied with B.F. Skinner. Mm-hmm. But I had a friend in Oklahoma I went to visit, and while I was there, I sat in on a Psych 1 class, and Roger Fouts, one of the first chimpanzee sign language workers in the United States, brought a young chimpanzee up on the stage and held up a pair of keys and the chimpanzee signed key and he held up a hat and the chimpanzee put their head on the hand on the top of their head and signed hat and a number of other things and I began to realize that if there really is another species besides humans that has language then we need to be understanding that because it's language that really shapes our behavior. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want, I just when you said that, I think this is an interesting point to make. Your definition of language was they signed key, they signed hat. So I think that uh, many of us think that language is only something that has to be oral, has to come, it has to be- Or mimic, s- mimicry? Well, I mean, but so what is language by definition? I, I'm just really asking. So I'm thinking some people think you have to speak the words from your mouth and it make, has to make a sound, a certain sound. I don't know. Apes' throats are a little bit different than ours. So when they make sounds, it's very hard for them to make uh, like guh and duh. So they make sounds with a little bit like a mm sound and a uh sound. So because they can't make exactly the same kinds of sounds we do and because they don't have as much control over their breath as we do uh, people have used plastic symbols they've used written words they've uh, used signs like that like deaf people use Mm -hmm. to get around the speech kind it's kind of like a speech impediment that they have compared to us yeah so by definition though language is not just saying speaking with uh, you know sounds that come out of your mouth language is just communicating is do we have a definition for language well linguists have defined language uh, as something that is structured it uses grammar it has uh, verbs it has objects it has rules it has rules <laughs> It has a structure when you speak so that you can anticipate what I'm going to say by your knowledge of that structure and my knowledge of that structure. But of course, language can be printed on a piece of paper. It's Mm -hmm. not the mode, it's more the actual sum and substance of how meaning is transferred from one mind to another. Okay, I like that one, how the meaning is transferred. 
So there's got to be a lot more in terms of the interpretation. It's just not going through the motions of making sounds or writing symbols. It's about putting a understanding behind it. Yeah, is the meaning being transferred? Do I know what you're talking, do you, what you're expressing to me in whatever way you're expressing it, but it can still fall under that umbrella of language. And I think yeah. that's an important distinction to make yeah. if you're trying to understand this conversation that we're having. No, I think it's good. We're gonna take a quick break and it's a good point to, to break. And uh, we'll be back in just a few moments. It's Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show with our wonderful guest, Dr. Sue Savage Rumbo. I just call her Dr. Sue. <laughs> And, of course, Cindy Vickers, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. We're here at Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, and Cindy, I've been visiting with Dr. Sue Rumbau, my very good friend, and also very, very special person, lady, and everything else. Um, what does that say? It She's says orangutan. Orangutan, okay. It's supposed to tang. Oh, okay. And you know what it means, by the way? No. Man of the forest. Man of the forest. Right? That's right. There you go. See, you learned something. I did. Okay. Anyway, we had just finished a, a really good introductory discussion, and we were talking to Sue about how she working towards how she got into research. So you were continuing and telling us a little bit more about what dro what drove your interest in your training, and then how, how did you end up where you ended up? Well, when I was in that Psych 1 class and saw that chimpanzee on the stage, I thought I needed to learn more about this particular being. And they said, well, there's a chimp farm outside of town, and you can come and there are 30 or 40 more of these things out there. And so I drove out there rather hesitantly and uh, was shown around a room with many chimps behaving inappropriately, as you say. Yeah. And after we went out of that room, they said, now you're going to see chimps that know some language and know how to sign. None of these do. And you won't ever come back in this room again. You'll be dealing with these ones that live on an island or live in human homes. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's really good. I don't want to go back into that building <laughs> well, ever hold on again. A Give me one example of behaving inappropriately. <laughs> oh, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> it was inappropriate, and it scared excellent. you. That's why it's inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> okay oxygen for cindy please <laughs> okay. and i have to tell you i have seen sue and other uh, primatologists that uh, for instance um, i used to go to a conference every second or third year they had a chimp conference and jane goodall would open the conference and everybody there were field people and they would all start by pant hooting and and talking like they were out in the field with chimps and you thought you were in a room with chimpanzees, but it was the same kind of thing. But, you know, it's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> were they threatening? Were they trying to be, you know, Yes, they were throwing feces and oh, all kinds of okay, things. Okay, yes. there you go. And yeah, like my fraternity. Right. Inappropriate. Right, thing. <laughs> it's an inappropriate behavior. Okay, I'm sorry. Before and, you and scared later me to death. I, I went back in to see that group, and I lost the end of my finger. So <gasps> it's not an idle threat. Oh, it's a yeah. real threat. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. So the tip of her her yeah, index gone. finger is right. gone. They, right. Did they bite it? They bit it off. <gasps> so well. there was a trust issue there, <laughs> or <laughs> yeah. a, a naivety. A naivety who on they my just, part. Yes. Just wants a chimp as a pet. Maybe think again. Right. That's right. Well, they do have fangs that are probably the males probably a good inch and a half, inch to inch and a half, a quarter or so. Wow. Pretty scary. Did that hurt like crazy? Yes, and it bled like crazy, too. <laughs> Dang. So go from there. So that was your first step. <laughs> well, that was my first step, but I, I actually ended up spending hundreds and hundreds, thousands of hours actually watching that group later for my dissertation mm -hmm. to try to understand ape behavior. With a barrier in between. With right? a wire yeah. in between. There you go. Well, she just knew now not to just stick trust finger, to stick her finger. Because they don't in. feed the <laughs> yeah. apes. <laughs> okay, so then you you got your dissertation, and then you were working specifically with chimps and language at this point, or did you grow into that role someplace? Well, prior to the time I got my dissertation, I learned that there was a special species hidden in the heart of the darkest Congo called bonobos that Robert Yerkes had studied, and he had co-reared a bonobo and a chimpanzee together from birth before it was really understood that bonobos were a different 
kind of species. And he felt that bonobos were far more intelligent and far more loving and kind than the chimpanzees. So I became interested in them, and I took a trip to San Diego to study them, and then I heard that they were being imported to Yerkes. So I went to Yerkes to try to— Which is a primate (coughs) center in in Emory University in Georgia. Yes, a primate research center. And I had a a postdoc there with Dwayne Wormbaugh from Georgia State University Mm -hmm. and studied these very— bonobos that had recently come out of the heart of the darkest congo and Mm -hmm. compared them to groups of chimpanzees how many were in that original group it was matata five came and two were infants and they died Uh, within the first few months so there were three in the original group matata and an older female actually she looked to be in her 80s and she had arthritis and cataracts and Mm -hmm. gray hair Mm -hmm. Uh, and Bosanjo, a male. So they're young male and young female, mm-hmm. adolescent, almost adolescent, and a very old female. Did Matata breed with the male? Early? Yes, oh, yes. Okay. And they had uh, quite a few offspring. Cool, very cool. So I noticed I just cool. caught your your professor's name was Rumbau. Yes. And your mm-hmm. name is Rumbau. Yes. So that kind of means something, right? Well, eventually we married. Right. <laughs> uh, I figured that not out. Not that day, though. No, it was just day one. But you started, we started to talk about you were observing the chimp versus the bonobo. And so at, what did you observe at that point in time? I mean, you had heard that they were more loving and that they were uh, Did you immediately see smarter. this? Did you feel the same way that you saw a very clear distinction? Well, I can tell you that within a week I was in the cage with all three. Mm. <clears throat> and I wouldn't have done that with any of the chimpanzees that, that I met at Yerkes, although many other chimpanzee, I, chimpanzees I would have. Mm-hmm. But just as humans are very different depending on their rearing, uh, chimpanzees are very different and bonobos are very different depending on their rearing. But these three bonobos had been reared in the wild. Mm-hmm. And at first they were so scared of me that any time I was in front of the cage, they would just run inside and hide. Mm-hmm. And I could not observe them. I took... a like a week trying to habituate them, and I could not observe them. That sounds like a pretty short time. <clears throat> well, to maybe a little. Well, maybe a little longer. But guess what I did in order to be able to observe them? You got you naked and like started. A bonobo. <laughs> I you well, dressed like a bonobo. You put some kind of fur all over you or something. You no. Gave them food. No. How many guesses do we get? One more. It's a behavior. <laughs> you. You acted like them. You started. Yeah, you started to pant- walk like they it. did. And you were you talking like they were and trying to mimic their sounds. No, since they ran and hid every time they saw me, whenever I saw them, I ran and hid. Oh, very <laughs> funny. That's oh, cool. So now you don't look like you're the uh, predator. You yeah, you're prey. subordinate now. Yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. I behaved as though I were fearful of them. So they kept coming closer and closer and looking and looking. And whenever they'd stamp their feet, I'd run away really fast. <laughs> That's great. So I was able to get to know them and then able to go into the cage with them. So tell me about the first time you went into the cage. What was that all about? uh, It's kind of all of a blur. I I just remember them. I'd already touched them and interacted with them through the wire and everything Uh like that. And I walked in and... I remember them standing back a little bit and then just coming over and climbing up on me and we were grooming and walking around and very good sounds like my then first, the next first day with my wife <laughs> <laughs> kind of went like that well, the, the next biggest day was when i started taking them outside of the cage wow which i don't think anyone at the yerky center had ever taken any ape outside of a cage but did they give you trouble about that or they were very nice dr jeffrey Bourne was just fine yeah i remember dr Bourne. that's great <laughs> But so when you're outside of the cage, you're still within some kind of complex. You're not like just out in the neighborhood, right? Well, they're not inclined to go run away. They're going to be insecure and they're going to stay close to what's familiar, I would think. Yes, they did. But I also had a lead on them. And there's also barriers of trees of several acres on the outside. Oh, barriers of trees. So we're not talking about being inside a building. No, no, outdoors. Wow. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying, there is a structured building there, the Yerke Center, but it's surrounded by forest. It's pretty... Yeah, but she's saying she was not inside the building. That's my question. I was not inside the building. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you started inside to get outside. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) that's the thing, but she wasn't even inside a building. There's just trees. Oh, I know, I know. Wow. I mean, easily they could have pulled away from you and and disappeared if they wanted to, but Mm -hmm. But they they probably loved it, yeah. 
Very, very interesting. So then you kind of created your own studies, and um, I know that you love language, and uh, tell us a little bit about how you decided that I need to structure this, and what was your first question that you were trying to answer? Well, actually, I had been working with Roger Fouts studying sign language when I was at the University of Oklahoma, but uh, I became convinced that the apes were able to communicate almost everything with nonverbal gestures and glances that they could with signs, so I focused on that in my dissertation. Mm -hmm. Then when I got the postdoc at the Yerke Center, I met Lana, who punched symbols on a keyboard and when she did they lit up and a computer recorded everything that she said mm -hmm. and she could control all kinds of vending devices and get m&ms or chow or watch a movie or open a window or close a door did so you say lana lana, lana. 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 a chimp okay uh, lana so, is a so chimp. she had choices she had choices she could but she wasn't at that time making language she was really just picking she had an association that this symbol means I get an M and M, right? Or was she actually making, constructing a uh, a sequence of thoughts? Unlike all the other apes, Lano had to use syntactically structured correct sentences. Mm -hmm. So she couldn't just say M and M and get an M and M. <clears throat> she could ask a trainer for M and M. She could ask a machine for M and M, but she had to say, "Please, machine, give M and M." So she had to create some kind of sentence structure. Yeah, because it, earlier when she said what the definition of language was, it had to have grammar and it had to have a verb, I think. And, and now she's saying it has to have proper syntax. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that's, I mean, this is wildly impressive. And this is really the heart of the matter in terms of your research, right? Is this, is this language ability in bonobos. So, well, I don't giving, know. giving, we're going to break here in a second, but basically giving... Uh, a method for these chimps and bonobos to express what they could, you know, instead of just, right? I mean, it's just yes. like, instead of just the blanket, here's your food, I'm going to hose down, don't eat that, you know, or whatever barking orders, she was actually trying to give them an opportunity to communicate mm -hmm. in, in some structured way and with meaning. So we're going to uh, just take a real quick break, but this is really amazing material, and Sue's amazing. So um, this is Dr. Doug. And Cindy of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, and again, our wonderful guest, Dr. Sue Rumbaugh. And we'll be back again in just another moment. Thank you. Like me, like me home, daddy. Can learn to be like someone like you. One more time. Yeah, can learn to be like someone like me. We've got a gorilla for sale. Here we go. We're in segment three of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. And again, Cindy and I are speaking with Dr. Sue Rembo. She's introducing her studies in uh, language and communication with the great apes in particular. And I know a lot of her studies, I've talked to her a million hours about her interests in porpoises and other uh, animals communicating whales and stuff like that. But well, let's continue. I mean, you're just fascinating information. So... Okay, so you've got an opportunity now. You start working with the bonobos. And kind of tell us where you took that and, and how far you got with what you were trying to prove. Well, one of the first things I found was that the bonobos made lots of gestures in captivity. You mean like physical with their hands F or face? Physical gestures with their hands. Okay. And they would indicate what kind of position, if they wanted another bonobo to turn around or to sit down or to hold out its arm or its hand. So they had a whole gestural language that mm -hmm. they were very efficient at using with each other. And again, these animals came from the wild. They so came from the wild. So they brought that with them. Brought, yeah, they, that's very they brought that with them. Yeah. It wasn't something contrived through relationships and cages with humans and stuff. And they had a wide range of vocalizations that accompanied those gestures. And chimpanzees did not generally make such elaborate gestures or have a wide range of vocalizations that accompany them. Can I interrupt for one second? Were the vocalizations uh, different for each gesture, or sometimes it would be the same vocalization for more than one gesture? Well, that's a really good question, and nobody's been able quite to answer that yet because it's a very complex system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't think the vocalization was 
something that was the same as the gesture because if I'm talking and gesturing to you, my gestures aren't exactly the same as my words. I don't mean the same as the gesture. I mean that the, the gesture for sit down had a particular vocalization and it was only used for sit down. And there was a different vocalization for stand up and it was only used for stand up. I mean, that kind of fixed specific relationship. vocalization for each particular gesture. I, I believe they had vocalizations that uh, are like whole phrases, and their gestures were more specific. Okay. But uh, so that's kind of like uh, the Chinese language, you know, in the sense that it's uh, the written language is about symbols representing a whole meaning, whereas the not speech not word for word. Yeah. Right. It, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Well, same thing with sign language. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. not always, to, it can be, but it's not necessarily. Yeah, I don't know, but I always wanted to learn. I just was too lazy to do it. But So go ahead. This is Well, so at the same time I was studying oh. this phenomenon in bonobos, I was also studying the use of four young chimpanzees learning for the first time to use symbols, uh, the same kind of symbols that Lana used on a, on a board. And because there had been a lot of concern that Lana or maybe other chimpanzees that had learned some kind of human language were being cued by humans. I focused on having two chimpanzees, Sherman and Austin, be able to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. Without imposing. Without even a person, without even a person there. Uh -huh. So when I saw the bonobos being able to do this with gestures, mm -hmm. and, and really, and their own vocalizations in some ways more advanced than what I was trying to teach Sherman and Austin do with symbols on the board, I volunteered to try to put a bonobo in language work and see what a bonobo could be able to do. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I really wanted to do was to try to give a bonobo as an environment that was as much like a human child has as possible without trying to turn it into a human child. Right. Because if you want to ask, can a bonobo do what a human can do, it has to have a fairly similar environment. So I gave one of the bonobos Matata and her first son, Kanzi, the opportunity to live in a large forest, to travel through that forest, and to use symbols to talk about where they wanted to go and what they wanted to do. And I had people who walked through that forest with them. And recording all this? Rec recording that and using these symbols themselves. Uh -huh. And instead of teaching Kanzi the way other apes had been taught, we just let Kanzi be a part of the group and look to see if he would learn, and he did. He wow. learned quite rapidly these symbols on his own without any training. And not only was he learning the symbols, he was learning the spoken English word. Yes, so, in terms of hearing it and understanding it. In exactly. terms of hearing it and understanding it. So right. that, Essentially, he is having training. It's not, it's not formal human training. He was being... It's like a child growing up in their right. environment and picking it up and learning. Yeah, right. That's exactly right, but prior to that time, People had raised apes in fairly restricted circumstances. In small cage, they slept by themselves. They had people around, but they weren't raised with love and care in a family, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Kanzi was raised in that world, and they had found apes didn't begin to imitate the signs unless they taught them to, or they didn't begin to punch the symbols on the keyboard unless they taught them to. They, they had all required training. By people when they were when they were raised in captivity, as opposed yes, to having so, a more natural environment. So, in the same sense that it, a dog might require training to sit on command, and you might re reward the dog for training to, to sit on command. Uh, that's what people had done with apes, only with a larger vocabulary. So now, Kanzi Amazing. is learning this on his own, like a human child learns, and you're you're recording. His ability to expand his knowledge base and his uh, his ability to communicate. Well, and even with um, a dog, if, if okay, just one example. If you were training a dog to be a hearing dog, somebody who could uh, work with an individual who's deaf, they don't get trained in the same way that another service dog would be trained, for example, because they have to be able to make their own decisions. Because if you are deaf, you can't say go 
go to the door and let me know somebody's at the door. They have to be able to make some decisions on their own and and what often ha- happens rather than be directed always by a human. Mm-hmm. So what happens often is they start doing lots more um lots more activities and alerting more to many more sounds that they've been trained to because they just figure out that I need to communicate with this person that there is a noise or something happening in an area and they 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 take this on as their own and they figure out how to communicate it with their owner mm-hmm. and 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 part of that I believe is because they are not really over trained and over controlled well, so do you think a dog could y- learn to use symbols the way a child learns to use symbols? Or the way a bonobo learns to use the way, Or the way Kanzi did. Um, well, it, it, you know, I can't know that answer. I don't know that there's any research done on this. If there is, I don't know about it. But it seems to me like it would be perfectly possible because, a, because a, you know, for example, a dog learns that if you pick up their leash – they that is the communication is we're going for a walk you don't have to say anything you don't have to or they pick up their own leash and exactly bring it to you don't have to make them go to the door but probably they're going to start dancing around or they're going to sit so you can put on the leash or they're going to run to the door uh-huh. and it does not necessarily have to be specifically trained if i pick up my leash go to the door they know what the meaning of it is. and then that's just a um a 3d symbol right mm-hmm. and so uh well, I think could they Sue, take it to just? Could they take it if it's one dimensional, like and see it on a piece of paper? Yes. In fact, I'm I'm positive that that there has been work where they where signs have been held up, and dogs have understood what that printed sign means, and then specifically um, responded to that. Horses also. Mm-hmm. Um, even but even something is yeah. <laughs> even as much as when you're doing target training and you may have just say a a piece of yellow paper and you teach the the any animal to touch it and then when they learn to touch it you can start moving it farther and farther away. I mean it still is a symbol of sorts and they react to that symbol. So I think that I think that would be quite viable. Is that the same foundation of what you're? interested in studying with because you believe that the dogs can probably pick up symbols right and well uh they have shown that dogs can learn spoken words mm-hmm. and they can even on trial one if they hear a new spoken word pair it with a new object mm-hmm. i mean bruno my son can that's right <laughs> and I'm, so the step that hasn't yet been taken with dogs is the step we took with Kanzi, mm-hmm. which is to have a board of symbols around that we're touching when we want to transfer meaning and that Kanzi can touch if he wants to transfer Oh, because it la- has to be able to go back and forth of its language, right? Well, if a, if a dog has only receptive language, it's kind of like if you could only listen and you could understand what you were listening to, but you weren't allowed to speak. So for language, you really need the receptive capacity and the productive capacity. And dogs have notoriously, you know, learned these commands to herd sheep or do all kinds of amazing things but they've not had the opportunity to be expressive. And since there are so many dogs in so many homes, you know, I kind of wonder, why don't we take that initiative and give them the chance to be expressive? But but I think that they, depending upon who the um, owner is and what the environment is, they are expressive. You know, and and again, when you are talking about, uh, we've had many conversations about positive reinforcement training and no punishment kinds of training or fear-free training that you'll see the dogs taking much more initiative. So I I think that that's a very real um, study in terms of I think you might find that that is possible, especially if you can be with people who are capable of not cueing the dog. Well, let me, uh, I have a real quick couple stories real quick. I don't know if I can fit them in, but um, first of all with Bruno, uh, I find him sitting, um, and we didn't teach him this. So we're in bed, we've got a little gate, and if he wants to go outside, he'll either come up in the middle of the night and just kind of do, you know, try and get my attention by pawing me, or he'll go, he taught himself to go to that gate and scratch on the gate. And to me, that's kind of like, I gotta find a way to communicate with these people, and these are my two choices that I think are most responsive. 
Mm-hmm. So he's almost playing me. Is that is that mm-hmm. kind of where we're talking about that he's actually expressing a need and a desire, and he's got a way to do it? Yeah. I find that very he's gesturing advanced. Yeah. It's just not with a picture. Yeah. We're going to have to take a real quick break, and we'll be back with our final segment. We'll do a recap, and then uh, we're going to have to have you back because there's too much information, (laughs) so we haven't begun. But anyway, we'll be right back. Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, and Cindy, Sue, and Dr. Doug will be right back to talk to you. Welcome back, everybody. It's Dr. Doug Pernikoff of the Clarkson Wilson Veterinary Clinic, my wonderful co-host and trainer, Cindy Vickers. If you need to get a hold of us, you can get us at our clinic number, 314-761-8583. Cindy's available for training, and I'm there to help you with your critter care and health. So I want to take a moment quick and just thank Dr. Sue Rumbaugh for being here with us. It's been amazing and uh, just sharing a little bit of her history. We're going to have a continuation show because there's too much wonderful knowledge here. So that's going to be posted on YouTube, and you guys can uh, take a a look and listen and and learn a little bit more about bonobos and language studies with great apes. At Dr. Doug's All Things Animal on YouTube. But I want to thank you personally for all that you're doing and all that you've done and your commitment to your science and what you've accomplished so far. Thank you so much for the opportunity to no, be here, Dr. Doug. thank you. <laughs> and Cindy, do you have any comments? We taught you a new word, didn't we? She likes no, to learn you didn't teach word. me because I have no idea. I had No, I don't know the word, so I didn't learn it. Okay. What was it? Something about your jaw sticking out or not sticking Prognathism. out. Prognathism. Prog, spell it. Pronath, pro, it's, is the G silent? I think it's P-R-O-G-N-A-T-H. I-S-M. I-S-M, yeah. So... You know, kind of like a dolicephalic dog. But wait a minute. It, pronath, pronathism is when the jaw does jut out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Big word. Mm-hmm. We're going to test you next week, too. Pronathism. I got it now. <laughs> so anyway, do you have any questions or any comments for I have a million. Sue? Yeah, I have a few. But I don't know we can just do in an in a summation because I think we just really began to talk about these. Um, what these. amazes you the most about what you've heard today? Um I think the thing that is most uh, fascinating to me in terms of I want to know is about having language, because now I'm actually thinking about in terms of dogs, but it's not about being trained to respond so much to a some kind of cue. It's about the difference between that and actually having language. And and how would you... How would you necessarily recognize that? How can you? It, it does have to be taught. Well, it's it's about. But you don't giving, know if they learned it if you don't cue it. Well, See, I, it's going to start a whole conversation. Well, I think it's, I know. I think it's giving them a foundation of skill sets or tools that allow them to demonstrate not only the ability to make language but to comprehend and create thought and planning and stuff like that is it yeah yes okay? except that what she said is that let's suppose i showed you a picture of a uh, a cookie mm-hmm. and i said and whenever you pointed to that either accidentally or on purpose i handed you a cookie well then after a while you're going to learn that if well, you touch cookie you get a cookie but what that's what she's that's what she's saying is not what you want to do because mm. that is being cued and trained right to use it that way. Am I correct about correct. that? Yes. So that's why I want to see what is the difference and how do you get it if you can't train it in that kind of way? Well, I think that's a great question, but you ain't going to learn it today. No, I'm not. <laughs> so, yeah. But no, it's wonderful. It's a cliffhanger. I, do you have any final statements you want to make? Well, I want to say that I'm glad people are talking and thinking about what it is that dogs might do. I think there's a lot of... Uh, we're still trying to figure out what Doug's will do. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of frontier to be explored there, and I'm very pleased to be exploring it with you uh, and with Dr. Doug. <laughs> okay, so tune in <laughs> next week. <laughs> well, whether it's next week or the week after, we'll definitely have another uh, uh, you know, discussion with Sue. Dr. Definitely. Sue. And again, if you guys have any questions, you want to know more about bonobos, Google them. 
there's great studies about them and they're just a special animal i mean well some people don't even consider them an animal so i have to be careful when i say that i got in trouble at one meeting remember everybody yeah, you called me. them critters i called them critters and everybody there was pro bo- pro bono they wanted to kick him <laughs> off the pro bono they wanted to kick me off the team <laughs> i don't i don't like that word either critters i don't like it i always loved it anyway I want to thank you all. It's great, Cindy, to have you here. And, of course, Sue, I I just enjoy being with you all the time. So thank you very much, Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. I'm signing off for today. Thank you. everybody back to our bonus segment we thought there was so much interest in talking with dr sue rumbaugh we want to continue a little bit and again this will be posted as a youtube and you can listen to it and enjoy it so let's pick up where we left off i was interested in hearing um kind of the evolution of your research and uh working with the bonobos and chimps and the language studies and i'm trying to understand kanzi i know is a very famous bonobo uh, probably one of the most famous characters in the world. And everybody has seen as many videos and the, of the kind of work you were doing. So what would you say now, so we're, we're spinning ahead, what, 35 years of research. Can you give me kind of the most important elements and steps of accomplishment in your research, in your mind? Where did you take Kanzi and where is it driving you for the near future? Well, I'll give it a try. Okay. I I think that the question that Cindy asked about the training Uh and the stimulus and the response versus the way in which Kanzi just learned language and children just learn language, that question has preoccupied the field for about three decades. Mm -hmm. And it really reflects the difference between what we think of ourselves doing as humans and what we think of as animals. In a way, Cindy, it's why you're a called an animal trainer or a dog trainer you know you have very few child trainers that come to your house to teach your child language although i needed one (laughs) (laughs) if your child doesn't have language it doesn't participate in the human community and it's considered to have some really extensive disability and it may take a lot of work and some people that work with children that have no language worry that the children do learn a kind of a rote way of asking to go outdoors, a rote way of asking to go to the bathroom. And children can learn those kinds of things in response to various stimuli, and they can touch symbols to say that they would like to do those things, but that's not what Kanzi did. Right, and I do work with children that have no oh, language, and they do have um, all kinds of devices and So you're thinking about what she's saying. And yeah, right, yeah, right yeah. on. So tell us more about the Kanzi yeah. uh, perspective. Yeah. So, um, the idea with Kanzi was to extend to him what what a, a mother would extend to the child, the expectancy that you're going to learn language. But Kanzi, not having a vocal tract like ours, couldn't speak language. So, he needed to touch a board that had a symbol on it if he wanted to express his desire to go someplace in the forest, for example. And very early on, by the time he was one or one and a half, Kanzi began to spontaneously express his desire to go to different places in the forest, to tickle, to chase, all kinds of other other things. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the most important thing that he did, and this is how language is really learned, this this is the way of trying to answer your question, Cindy. Mm -hmm. It's, It's a small answer. It's like the tip of an iceberg. So I can give you the tip, but there's a lot more underneath. So just a minute. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think that, that it's not been explained on this bonus segment what the question is. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a good point. We okay. have to backtrack because we don't know who's, who's heard the first section. So go for so it. So I, I think that w- what we're talking about right now is the difference between uh, language as you're trying to describe it, meaning that somehow it's occurring naturally and that it there is a uh, it's a receptive part where you understand what's being said to you and there's a productive part where you're expressing something that you want to communicate. 
as opposed to, and this is where it's actually confusing to me, what really is the difference? And I'm still thinking, is there really a difference? Me training, and we're gonna say a dog, for example, and I, um, even if, if we could use a picture, if I always held up a picture of a star, and then I gave the dog, um, um, let me see, and then when the dog sat, I gave him a tree, eventually, um, just the star would cause the dog to sit. So that's the dog responding to a picture. Um, or a symbol. Or, or maybe I would even do it to the point where he had to put his paw on the picture on the ground. Every time he put his paw on the star, um, I would give him a treat if he sat. So eventually he'd mean he'd learn that I put my paw on the star and I'm supposed to sit. And he's thinking that will uh, garner him a reward at some point. But that's not what you're saying that language is when you're getting a cue and then you respond to the cue. Star is a cue and the response is you sit. So, and the difference is, take it away, Sue. <laughs> well, a, as Very you good. know, when a child starts to understand language, you can read them stories in a book. You can read them Little Bo Peep. Uh, you can tell them when daddy's coming home or daddy's going on a trip and they can think about things that are in the past. They can think about things that are in the future. They can listen to conversations between you and other people, and they can draw information from those conversations. Okay, so now we're talking about cognitive ability and how that, uh, how that. It's an expression of real communication, real language. In, mm -hmm. in other but words. you have to have this ability, this cognition in order to have language. Well, if you want to call it cognitive, cognitive ability, you're thinking of something that sort of exists in the head and language maps onto it. I think of language as actually creating it. The brain is this neural space and the, as you begin to understand and comprehend language, you're becoming human and you're mapping your brain. I call, I call it making your brain a language brain. So your brain is processing everything that comes into your world through this linguistic filter. But the, ling but the language is what's creating that sort of muscle for it to understand more language. Muscle That's memory? I, you're saying. Kind of no, I wasn't really mean muscle memory. I really just mean that you're saying the language is creating the ability to have language. It's not the ability is there, and then you can get language if the ability already exists. Well, there is a little muscle aspect to it. In a way, when I'm speaking to you, I have a meaning, something in my mind that I'm trying to get to your mind. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to catch it and then speak back to me and ask, did I catch it? And if you look at the exact words, sometimes the meaning is awfully hard to find, but yet you get it. So it's a kind of a puzzle, how does that happen? But the actual method by which we do it, we can do it on a teletype, we can do it with words, we can do it with gestures. And you do have to have muscles that actually do those things. And they have to go through, especially in speech, very, very rapid program sequence of planned movements that the brain has to do extremely rapidly. And then you have to interpret it with an extreme degree of rapidity. So both of those processes are going on. But the basic process, is that I have some idea in my mind and I want to get that idea to your mind. And w we really can use a wide variety of words to do it. That's why we talk about metaphor all the time. So I'll give you a real simple example that I've used before. Let's say two men are sitting at a bar and a beautiful woman walks by. Yeah. Dr. Doug will like this example. So yes, he's, very much. he's attending. <laughs> you always want attention of your listeners. <laughs> so, you got it. <laughs> so, so one guy turns to the other and he says, do you want to go fishing? So you know what the meaning of that is, but it has nothing to do with fish. So you, I've instantly. Depends on the girl. I've instant, <laughs> well, he's asking, do you want to go fishing? So I've instantly transferred meaning to you with words that if you look them up in the dictionary would either be something you can't point at or define and a word that really has nothing to do with women. But because of how I've used it, you've understood that meaning. And in a sense, that's the essence of what language is doing every time we use it with one another. That's why the simple pairing of a star with a reward if the dog does a certain thing doesn't ever really lead to language, whether it's with children that have no language or a dog, that method won't work. 
keep going. Well, okay. Let's, let's so, put that back into the Kanzi perspective then. I think we want to hear some of that. Um, so because Kanzi was a member of a tribe, so to speak, an interspecies tribe, there were bonobos there and humans. They had common goals. They were going through the forest together, tickling, playing, chasing, figuring out where to go, seeing snakes, seeing wild raccoons, seeing deer, getting hungry together, sleeping together, grooming together. They came to have a common world view with common feelings about things and common desires and common needs. So Kanzi tuned in to what we're saying because we're salient beings in his world. And he began to try, as a child normally does, to comprehend what's being said about him. Because the route into language is not pointing at something and giving a reward. The route into language is figuring out what those adults or older kids around you are saying. You want to be like them. So you try to figure out how they're saying things because you can't be like them if you can't comprehend language in its full sense and be a part of the group. Did you see a period of struggle where he would physically try and verbalize like a human the same way we do? Well, he began to try to, to vocalize, but he had a different kind of throat. So he would try to say peanut like Mm-hmm. And banana, like eh, eh, eh. an apple, like ow, ow. So he got the syllable, uh, the numbers down. He just couldn't make the exact sounding, pretty much. Because he doesn't have a vocal track like ours. Yeah. So he couldn't really do the consonants, but he could do the inflection. Mm-hmm. Okay, but so then, then where does this this lexicon? Is it lexicon? Am I saying that right? Where does the lexicon come in? Because that's about pointing to pictures. Well, to get a particular response. Well, along with Kanzi, we also were working with children that had language disabilities. And many of the children, like Kanzi, would try to say, apple. And their mother wouldn't understand they were saying apple. Mm-hmm. So the children are worked with in a manner similar to Kanzi. And they began to pick up the symbols without training. So if a child pointed to a symbol for apple and said, apple, the mother then could pair it because she would hear it. Oh, and she would say, well, my child's really trying to talk. My child just said apple. Like artistic children. Before she couldn't do that. And so the, the symbols were very successful in that case because the mother could then drop the symbol off the keyboard once she actually understood it. Okay, so the language was actually there. It's just it wasn't uh, clear to understand. Yeah, well, all right, got it. But then also you could use the lexigrams to construct components of a full sentence, right? A, a full thought. So it's not just, again, pointing apple, but, you know, like I know that the bonobos in the Des Moines project had computers in their cages, touch computers, and they could actually, in some sense, plan their dinner by selecting and asking for certain things. Is that correct? Yes, they could combine symbols. Because they weren't taught structurally to combine symbols the way Lana did, they didn't make the elaborate combinations that she did. But then neither did any of the humans that worked with them, including me, make those combinations on their keyboard when they were young. I didn't really think that they would be able to use words like a and the and it and where. So those weren't on their keyboards initially, and I didn't require these long structured sentences at the keyboard. Prepositions and yeah. all kinds of things. But eventually, did you? I was starting to, yes. Kind of the work took a halt because we moved animals and bonobos around. <laughs> That's right. So where would you say, again, kind of in a summary of where Kanzi was at that point and where the work was going to be taking you? So I'm so sorry, but could I ask one question before sure. that? So then, therefore, could you expect, after time, to to have Kanzi communicate something that he wanted or just communicate something that had you had never seen before. So there would just be this spontaneous communication sometimes about things that you hadn't introduced to him or knowingly introduced to him. Yes, uh, I, I remember when uh, there was a flood in the building and they were very concerned that a turtle was gonna drown floating on a little log, you know. And they, they being the to, bonobos? Yeah, came to tell me to you know, help save the turtle. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, um, I just want to help her move along, but I know that, uh, can you explain us real quickly what the ApeNet concept and the program is uh, intended for? So she's come up with this wonderful idea. Well, I'm sure that Kanzi would like to know more bonobos. There are five in his group. He would like to know other bonobos in the United States, and he would like to communicate with bonobos in the Congo. So I would like to set up a, uh, something like an internet, only we're calling it an ape net. Skype. <laughs> <laughs> so that Kanzi can begin to talk with bonobos in other locations and also through the internet of things. He can control things in their, lo in their locale and they can control things in his locale. So they'll have uh, something to communicate about initially as we hook them up. He can, you mean like drone-like kind of things? He can control things in like a what kind well, of way? Well, he, he could control lights, he could control movies, he could control music, he could control windows, he could control special toys, robots, things like that. And then he could tell them about them. He could share them, share the concept of another yes. bonobo. And there, and th I think we were talking about this, but you'd like to start with uh, chimpanzees and bonobos that have had this very intimate human experience, and there are a number of them that have been raised in homes close to what Sue was hoping they would be like, right? And those would be probably your first best prospects to kind of get involved, is that correct? Yes, you remember I told you that we started looking at communication between chimps to see if one chimp could tell another chimp something without a person in the room? I Sher don't remember Sherman that, and but, but, Sherman but and I believe Austin. we did it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, Keep up with the group here. <laughs> sure, my best. There is a chimpanzee named Sherman that has learned lots of symbols and knows how to use a television and knows that a television can communicate things that are not present in time and space and over a distance. And he's a friend of Kanzi's. Kanzi knew him when he was young and they used to live in buildings close together. So that's where I'd like to set up the first communication is between Kanzi, who is in Iowa, and Sherman, who is in Atlanta, Georgia. And then build this out, not only to, but to Europe, well, into the Congo. Well, there's only well, what, wow. 64, I guess you have to get the internet. Well, there's only 64 bonobos in Something like captivity that. in the world or just in the U.S.? Somewhere between 60 and 70 in the U.S. and a similar number in Europe. Okay. And just one last thing. And is their captivity, uh, to the best of your knowledge, um, an environment that is where they could actually be, you know, happy and they can thrive in it? Or is it still well, very much like being in captivity? Varies. Some are zoos. Um, Yerkes, well, it doesn't have them anymore, but did uh, research facilities. Uh, there's a facility in, um, in France that has almost 19 or 20 uh, bonobos living pretty much in a sanctuary setting. They're not, you know, they're, they have a lot of bonobo, bonobo interactions because they kind of live almost normal. And then you have researchers in Japan that have worked with them for a long time. Mm -hmm. Germany probably has mm -hmm. some. Uh, so they're in all kinds of varied settings and then we're very interested because one of our board members for bhi sally cox is also bhi is uh bonobo hope initiative okay okay and um anyway so we're trying to kind of collect she's got bci which is bonobo conservation initiative initiative so she's been working in the field and has helped to create a number of sites that are now protected the normal housing and the normal geography of the bonobo life and what we want to do is kind of collect these opportunities and we call them resources and kind of integrate them in many ways like the ape net is one example and um, is that a fair statement definitely okay so yeah it's really neat i mean the, the, it's such a great opportunity but you know time is against us you know people are decimating forests and People have to understand the value of these target species because then they protect a lot of the animals below them in the same forest space. If you protect the forest because you're protecting the bonobo or the okapi or whatever, hopefully you're going to protect a ton of other species that are there. So the answer to the question was... <laughs> what was the question? I forgot. <laughs> are they, yes, I'm available tonight. Are they, are, they, are they living in environments that would be really conducive to their learning and that seem to be more like a sanctuary rather than, you know, a prison <laughs> in a cage? Well, I, I think in captive 
Captivity is difficult for apes. I'm certain that it's improved across the last 10 to 20 years. Uh, but when you really understand that a being such as Kanzi can have an extraordinarily high level of intelligence, he can speak about the past and the future, he can remember when he was a baby, he knows when he's being filmed by somebody who's making a special on bonobos and he helps plan the scenes, uh, you're dealing with a being that has a degree of free will and a degree of understanding of his own situation that needs more freedom than captivity can provide. So uh, n now that we as a species understand that, we need to develop a different kind of rapport with the apes that are living in the wild. You know, the first thing we learned was that we could go out and shoot them and bring home the pelts. And then we learned we could bring them into zoos and, and display them. And then we learned from Jane Goodall that they had emotions that were very much like ours and feelings that were very much like ours. And this is telling us that they have an extraordinarily high degree of intelligence. It might be different from ours. They might have different values and have adapted to a different way of life. But to think of them as lesser beings is, is not the right way to go about it. And we do need to have uh, symbolic linguistic communication between ourselves and the other living apes on the planet. Well, wow, that's a good ending Yeah, point, Doug and I differ greatly on this. I am really not a fan of zoos. He thinks that they're really important, but that can be just a different... I never said that. You, you don't think zoos are important? I thought you said it was important for us to get it sort of no, attached to animals. No, no, I think that zoos, and zoos have to organize themselves as... It, it's a, it's a non-refereed opportunity of resource that can be used in conjunction with real field stuff to help bring it together. I mean, we use... We use zoos to educate the general public about the beauty or specialness of any particular species because those are the people that are going to grow up and have the money to help us do things, right? So we have to, we have to educate them, but, you know, I'm not for bringing more animals into the captive setting. So, and I have, you know, I grew up at a zoo as a kid, and I loved it, and it's what stimulated me to want to go and do more so there's can be value in the zoos i just the problem with zoos is they become a business and they have priorities that are contrary in my mind to what the theme of of conservation should be so that's just my personal opinion is that clear yes <laughs> so we had a zoo person on in one of our other shows and he was great but he grew, grew up and everything was about the zoo so i may have misrepresented my interest there but anyway, I, I thought this was amazing. We have a great, great start. And again, there's still so much more. We're going to have to bring you back another time. But Thank I you. really appreciate you staying and doing this little extra outset for us. Hope the community gets a chance to listen and learn. And Cindy, you have any comments? Or? No, I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Rumba, for being here because it's completely fascinating. And I think that we could you know, we could probably stay here for hours and continue this conversation. Yeah, it's hard to understand. Sue's one of these people that is really, we were talking about this the other night, she's created an impactful life. And uh, so many people have grown up with her studies and her animals and know so much about Kanzi because of her. So, um, And I meant to say with a glass of wine. I don't know if I did, <laughs> didn't mention that, but that's, that's critical. Part. Or a blunt, who knows. But no. anyway, <laughs> I want to thank everybody for listening. If you have questions, again, you can always reach me at the Clarkson Wilson Veterinary Clinic at 636-530-1808 or send me an email at dpernikoff at gmail.com. And I can uh, help send links to you so you can learn more about bonobos, chimpanzees, Dr. Rumbaugh, and all her great work. Thank you. Thank you.